Hello everybody, it's me, Fax5, I'm the one and only, feeling better than last week, which is good. Currently I'm working on a bit of a vanity project, uh, well, basically, uh, how do I describe it? Remember like last video I did where I took uh, some clips of Archie Bunker from All in the Family? Well, what uh, a lot of Americans don't know is that it's based well, on a mix of Norman Lear's actual dad and a British show called Till Death Do Us Part, in which case the counterpart to Archie Bunker in the UK was Alf Garnet. Archie is a bigot, an old-fashioned racist and a jerk, but also deep down a good person who, when you get to the bottom of it, is really more afraid than anything else, you know, afraid that the world is just going to change and leave him behind, and he lashes out, but he, and over the course of the series, you know, he learns to be a better person. Alf Garnet, on the other hand, no, he's just vile. Like, a lot of the show is basically Alf suffering, and, well, I can't speak for everyone in the audience, but I can say I enjoy watching him suffer. I'm trying to, uh, work on some project where I compare and contrast, uh, well, mostly those two characters, but also the other casts, the other characters of those shows. Currently, I don't know how long it'll take. But, uh, as I'm working on that, and I guess some other IRL stuff, uh, I figured I'd do something a bit shorter this week. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Ayn Rand, and I've read a couple of her books, actually. And I've always found her to be just extremely elitist. And, in fact, what I'm going to be reading right here is a letter that uh, Ludwig Mises wrote to Ayn Rand praising her book, uh, Atlas Shrugged, which, at the time of the letter's writing, was pretty new. Uh, there's one particular line in this that tends to, well, be highlighted for good reason. And... Well, I'm pretty sure you can tell what it is when I read it. January 23rd, 1958. Dear Mrs. Rand, I am not a professional critic, and I feel no call to judge the merits of a novel, so I do not want to detain you with the information that I enjoyed very much reading Atlas Shrugged, and that I am full of admiration for your masterful construction of the plot. But Atlas Shrugged is not merely a novel, it is also, or may I say, first of all, a cogent analysis of the evils that plague our society, a substantiated rejection of the ideology of our self-styled so-called intellectuals, and a pitiless unmasking of the insincerity of the policies adopted by governments and political parties. It is a devastating exposure of the so-called moral cannibals and the so-called gigolos of science, and the so-called academic prattles of the makers of the so-called anti-industrial revolution. You have the courage to tell the masses what no politician told them. You are inferior, and all the improvements in your conditions which you simply take for granted you owe to the effort of men who are better than you. If this be arrogance, as some of your critics observed, it is still the truth that had to be said in this age of the welfare state. I warmly congratulate you, and I am looking forward with great expectations to your future work. Sincerely, Ludwig Mises. And there it is. That, uh, you know, that infamous line. The part about how you gotta thank people who are better than you for all the good stuff in life. And I mean, honestly, I mean, I haven't read Atlas Shrugged. I'll probably read it in the future, actually. I have read The Fountainhead, though. I've also read, uh, Anthem. <laughs> now, Anthem was actually pretty funny. Like, uh, Anthem takes place in this, uh, dystopia, you know, that is so collectivist that, uh, any singular pronouns are banned, in which case, you know, the main character always refers to himself as we rather than I. And, and then, like, the book, at the end, he basically goes on this madness rant, you know, it, I don't recall exactly 
what he said, but I remember just laughing because, you know, I was in high school when I read it, and he, he read almost like, you know, somebody going insane. He's like, yes, I shall beat live for myself. I, 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 <laughs> like, ah, yeah. And, and <coughs> excuse me. Guess I still got a little sickness left. But still, like, <laughs> come on, that guy was going mad at the end. Good lord. And, oh, God, the fountainhead. Oh, well, okay, no, no, you know what? You know what? L let me tell you how much I hate Howard Rourke, okay? He is like just a brat. He is l like, let me try to remember, okay? So, I, I mean, I've read the Fountainhead cover to cover, and it just gave me this incredible hatred for Howard Rourke as a character. He's just so poorly written. <sighs> so, like, you know, the book starts, um, and forgive me if I get any details wrong. In fact, I'm, it's a long book. I'm gonna. Basically, I'm going to skip over, you know, various subplots because, honestly, I only want to just, I mean, I just want to focus on Howard at the moment. So, uh, let, let's see. Okay, so we got Howard Rourke, you know, he is an architectural prodigy. You know, he's so good that uh, everybody else in the conformist architecture school can't stand him because, you know, every building in the city is boring and conformist, you know. I remember there was like this recurring theme of like, we always only ever use, I think, some sort of classical architecture stuff uh, or something like that or whatever. And basically, Howard Rourke is just, you know, he's the bad boy. He's so amazing. And okay, I'll, ex I'll, I'll accept, okay, maybe he's some sort of prodigy who's really good, whatever. Um, his friend or roommate or something is Peter Keating. Um, Keating is a talented individual, but a total pushover. He becomes important later. So, anyway, you know, Howard Rourke, he is kicked out of architecture school for being just too amazing. He starts up his own architecture firm, and he's talented, but he's such a jerk that uh, nobody wants to hire him. I remember there's even this one scene where there's, like, you know, some ex eccentric new money millionaire banker guy who wants to, you know, commission some brand new hit building, and he hires Howard Rourke, you know, the radical cool new guy. And, um, and the banker's like, hey, Rorky, I love your design, baby. Uh, I just legally have to run it by the board of directors. And the board of directors, they send it back with some changes, and Rorky just throws this hissy fit. And he was like, no, I will not accept any suggestions, any input at all. And you, you, um, like, who cares about that board of directors? You should just take Fyodor Pizzi, but take over all yourself. You, 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 you're amazing. Uh, you know, uh, you're the only interest that matters, that sort of thing. And, you know, he goes on this really wonderful speech of some sort. Um, of course, you know, nothing quite says, I guess, well, nothing, nothing quite says, you know, Ayn Rand quite like great men, great individuals who have no disregard, or sorry, who have complete disregard for any or everyone else because we don't actually live in a society, but it's okay, the great men will save us. Just submit yourself to their greatness and everything will work out. And then, uh, you know, Howard Rourke's architecture firm, it goes bankrupt. Peter Keating basically says to his face, like, Rourke, you know, you're really talented, just, you're a real jerk and nobody wants to work with you. And Rourke goes on another t typical Ayn Rand uh, speech of some sort. And then Keating is like, hey, you know, I've entered this contest, you know, we can design a building for, I think it was a movie theater or something like that. What do you think? And, um... Work is like, oh no, and he shows work his design, and work is like, oh no, this is terrible. And he, you know, basically just draws up on the spot a brand new building for Peter, and is like, here, use this one, you can claim it as yours. And then work just decides to fuck off and go work at a quarry for a bit. Now, Keating actually wins the contest using Rourke's building, but he's such a pushover that uh, he lets everybody, you know, insert their own suggestions into what the ideal building should be like, and by the time the building is actually built, uh, it's no different from any other building in the city. Now, Rourke is in the quarry, he's eh, living all right, he's doing a good job for himself. Um, and it's owned by this lady named Dominique, who was in the book prior, you know, she's this heiress lady. I, I remember there's this one scene where, like, she's in, I think it was, like, some sort of sociology lecture. And, uh, the sociologist professor is, like, talking gleefully, like, with this odd joy about how a new public housing project was built and how there are so many people living there who are, you know, basically welfare leeches. Like, they refuse to work, they don't want to work, they're drains on society, and, and, and the professor's just talking about how great that is and that sort of thing. 
But, yeah, now basically, uh, Dominique, you know, had a... She kind of knew work. She had a bit of a crush on him. And then she later goes to her quarry to kind of oversee it. And she thinks she sees Rourke. Because, you know, Rourke's been there for a while at this point. You know, he's he's gotten more muscular working in a quarry. He's, uh, you know, grown a beard, I believe. And, uh, you know, Dominique is pretty sure that's him. It is him, but she's not quite sure. You know, so what... And, like, you know, the sexual tension builds. So, like, she breaks something in her room. And she basically, you know, has Rourke come to fix it. Which he does. And, you know, this, you can cut the sexual tension with a knife at this moment. And then Rourke leaves. And then, and for I really don't know why Rand thought it was a good idea to put this in her book. But she did, okay? And uh, I'm gonna apologize to anyone who might be squeamish at, well, rape. Because Rourke literally then just breaks into her room and rapes her. Uh, this isn't a figure of speech or anything. He literally does that. The thing is, of course, Dominique actually, or secretly wanted that to happen, but like, this is the hero of the book, and he's a literal rapist. Like, like, I, I, I get it, it's a thin political, like, the book is supposed to be a thin political metaphor, but you'd assume you'd make your opponents do that, not the good guy of the story. Oh, good lord. Good lord. Um, I remember there's also this one part of the book that... It, it's amusingly actually the plot of the producers, and this was, you know, years before the producers of the film came out. Um, yeah, this book was from, like, I think 1947 or so. The producers was, like, 1963. Um, but basically what happened was, you know, there were these uh, corrupt... What's the word? These corrupt uh, businessmen, they wanted to do this thing, you know, where they would build a casino in the middle of the desert. I, I should say this was before Las Vegas was a thing. Basically, they were going to, you know, take far too much investor money to build a crappy casino in the desert, and then when the, you know, and then since the casino would go bust, they could run away with the extra money and just tell the investors, oh, the casino went bust. So what they did was they found Howard Rourke, who they presumed to be the worst architect in the history of ever, and they, they uh, hired him to, well, design a building in the middle of a desert. But don't worry, don't worry. See, his architecture is just so amazing, ooh, ooh, that people came from all over just to gawk at the wonderful new architecture. I mean, oh my god, what a man, ooh, ooh. Oh, good freaking lord. I mean, like, that is some Gary Stu nonsense right there. The fact that he's just so amazingly perfect that, you know, he could basically squeeze water from a rock, although, in, well, the architectural equivalent of it. As a reminder, this is before Vegas was a thing, so the idea of a casino in the middle of the desert was a bit absurd. But like, you know, they said the most the most important things about real estate are location, location, location. I mean, sure, I'm, I'm sure that people will go out of their way maybe to gawk at some sideshow, but there's a difference between, you know, the world's biggest ball of yarn and, um, and a literal, you know, multi-store, multi-story, multi-floor building and casino in the middle of the desert. Not to... <sighs> No, oh, don't worry. How we work is just Mr. Perfect. Ooh, ooh. Ugh. And then uh, there, there's some other stuff like there's what was his name? You know, there's Mr. I think his name was Tui or so. I, I think Tui was his name. You know, he was like this maybe this newspaper publisher or something. He's got his own subplot. I don't really care much about him. But uh, I think. Okay. oh yeah. Now the climax is like the ultimate Gary Stu moment. Okay, so. You know, uh, Peter Keating, he spent basically this time kind of a, a mix of off and on screen, well, on page, I guess, being, you know, a total pushover. He would design buildings that would eventually become boring and blend in with everyone else's, okay. And he was basically on his last legs, you know, because everyone thought, oh, he's just another boring designer. Um, Howard Rourke goes back to the city, and Keating basically begs him, he's like, uh, Rourke, okay, listen, I got one more contract before... Like, I, to really prove myself, it's a public housing project, and I need your help. And Rourke said, okay, but uh, you have to promise me that uh, you'll leave it exactly as is. Um, you know, you're not going to make any changes. Keating promises that he'll do that. But, of course, Keating, being the pushover he is, allows the people in, in charge of the actual building to make changes, and this angers Rourke. Rourke decides to wait until the building is completed, but before anyone actually moves in. He then blows it up. Yes, he, he just blows it up and turns himself in. And then, now this is the part that is just beautiful because it's, it is like some of the most 
Gary Stu nonsense ever. Like I, I the part is seared into my head. It said that uh, you know Howard Rourke he specifically refused a lawyer, and during jury juror selection, he uh, went out of his way to pick jurors who who he figured would be most hostile to him. He then gives this beautiful, rousing speech that is just so amazingly perfect that he's able to convince all 12 jurors to give him a jury nullification. I mean, like. People look at this and they say, oh, it's a great book. I mean, just just think about it. If anybody else wrote a story in which the protagonist not only refused to have a lawyer, but went out of his way to pick jurors who he figured would be hostile to him, and then was able to be so persuasive and charismatic that he convinced all 12 of them to give him a jury nullification, you'd probably call that out as absolute Gary Stu bullshit. But people actually read this book and they're like, yes, this is amazingness. I mean, good lord. Like, uh, you know, I wonder if this is like one of those, uh, what is it? What's the word? You know, like, I'm trying to re remember off the top of my head. Yeah, like with the Nigerian prince scams, you know, they'll deliberately use poor grammar and poor presentation to try to weed out any false positives to make sure that only the biggest idiots actually uh, fall for them. I wonder if that's the same thing with Iron Man. Like, she had the protagonists just be, like the protagonist, uh, you know, not only be so perfect that he can literally get away with rape because that was what the victim actually secretly wanted all along, but he's also so amazingly persuasive and charismatic that he can, uh, well, you know, build a, build a building in the desert that's so beautiful that people will flock from all over to see it, or, um, or, you know, deliver such a beautifully rousing, pa passionate and charismatic speech that 12 people whom he specifically expected to be as hostile to him as possible would give him a glorification. And, and like, it's like one of those things like, if you, I guess if your standards are that low, I mean, I will say that the book itself was well written insofar as the story flowed pretty nicely and it was easy to understand. And it, it's like, I mean, I will give her credit, she has good flow in her writing, and flow's not always the easiest thing to do in writing. But it's like, but the plot itself was just such, you know, asinine, Gary Stu, perfect boy garbage, that it legitimately confuses me why so many people like it. Like, I can understand, you know, everyone has different tastes, but like, I mean, this? Oh god. You know, now that I'm on the topic of Iron Man's books, I, I actually remember this uh, part from one of her books. I think it's called, like, if her first book was, like, you know, We the Awake or We the Living. Let me double check. Uh, we the Living. Yeah, that, that was it. We the Living. And there's this, uh, you know, interesting exchange between the main character named uh, Kira and uh, a man named Andre with Kira being, you know, the representative of individuality and Andre being the representative of collectivism. And they have this interesting discussion, you know. Uh, hang on. Now, I should say this particular discussion was removed in, in later editions of the book, but uh, I found a PDF of the first edition. I have, let me just, uh, you know, initially I wanted to include it in here, then I thought, nah, it would take up too much time, but then I'm like, you know what, I just spent the last, like, what, 10 minutes ranting about how much I hate Howard Rourke, so why not? Okay, so, uh, let's see, yeah, so I guess I can just pull it up, but... okay, so Andre says, uh, he looked down at her with his quiet shadow of a smile and patted her hand like a child's. Don't you know, he asked, that we can't sacri- we cannot sacrifice millions for the sake of the few? And then, um... Kira, Kira replies, Can you sacrifice a few when those few are the best? Deny the best it's right at the top and you have no best left. What are your masses but millions of dull, shriveled, stagnant souls that have no thoughts of their own, no dreams of their own, no will of their own, who eat and sleep and chew helplessly the words others put into their brains? And for those you would sacrifice the few who know life, who are life, I loathe your ideals because I know no worse injustice than giving than the giving of the undeserved, because men are not equal in ability, and one cannot treat them as if they were, and because I loathe most of them. Like, I, I mean, yeah, Iron Rand, she... Hang on, let me check it. 
Xbox to the page again real fast. Um, Okay, let's see. Revised edition. Okay, Ran, um, in 1957, Rand's novel, Isla Okay, Rand made some changes to the text in 1959. In her foreword to the revised edition, Rand declared that, in brief, all the changes are merely editorial line changes. Rand's description notwithstanding, some of the changes have ta taken that philosophical significance. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I should just say, she called them merely editorial line changes. Maybe she changed her mind, but, like, that line right there, like, literally saying like i because i loathe most of them it shows that uh, like that is extremely extremely elitist like extremely elitist you know it's this theme that you know these great men well, and, and women too so you got these great men and women who will lead us into the future and the rest of us normies well we have to you know we have no thoughts no dreams no will you know we just have to obey or get out of the way and it's honestly why i just can't stand Ayn Rand, and I get confused why people, well, you know, I I get confused as to people who seem to actually do like her, and, I mean, unless you admit you're an elitist or something, because she's extremely elitist. And, I mean, you know, as she said about commoners, she loathes most of them. That might be a fictional character talking, but let's be real here, this is clearly Ayn Rand, talking through a fictional character. Well, this rambled on far more than I anticipated. Um, feel free to smash that like button, subscribe, share it around, give me money. Or don't. I'm not your boss. I'm just Fax 5 And right now, I'm signing off.